Thank you, Joe, and thanks for inviting me to the uh, conference. I, I want to thank Roger for uh, being my straight man. He, he mentioned the uh, paucity of uh, women at the uh, Colorado School of Mines, uh, and <clears throat> it, was, it was nothing compared to the paucity of women at the uh, South Royalton event. <laughs> and in fact, there was really only one eligible uh, woman at that event, Ida Walters, who is now my wife. <laughs> I don't usually find myself the most competitive in these things in a large group of people, so I really regard it as one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me. <laughs> So in terms of what I have to say beyond that, which by the way, also when I was chatting with, with Ida at the time, she said, are you gonna be in New York soon? And uh, like, like Roger, I found a reason to go to New York soon. <laughs> which uh, fortunately I saw Murray at the same time. So there, I, what I wanna do is just really two things. One of them is just a few recollections of the conference. And then I wanna talk about sort of what happened uh, intellectually to me after that conference. Uh, everyone else has talked about before, and uh, you know, I, I started reading Ayn Rand in, in the ninth grade and was reading Human Action in high school. <laughs> so it's a merry, another thing that makes it surprising I was able to track Ida or any other female being that nerdy, you know. But <laughs> <laughs> so, at any rate, I, I want to talk about what happened afterwards because I went in a lot different direction, and I, and I think. Uh, you know, where I ended up, there's, there's uh, opportunity for Austrians and, and lessons. So, first of all, I, I want to remind everybody that the people who paid for the conference, to the best of my understanding, are the Koch uh, brothers. And uh, I, I guess their <coughs> ability to leverage money uh, is, is uh, exemplified by the fact they didn't have to spend a lot on accommodations. And look at the result they got, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm understanding why the left is so terrified of the Koch brothers when they can get so much for so little in terms of their investment in the early days of, of Austrian economics. And obviously, I, I applaud them for that, and I, I'm, a, I'm a great admirer of them. So the, the, the next sort of humorous things, you know, uh, my wife is, uh, of course, very charming. Uh, and uh, the most charming people at the conference, other than Murray, you know, were, were the Hazlitts, uh, Francis and, and Henry Hazlitt, who were just utterly delightful people. And uh, Ida spent quite a bit of time uh, with, with the two of them. And the first story, which, you know, it all begins with Anne Rand, right? Uh, the first story is that Francis actually worked in Hollywood with Ayn Rand at the studios. Uh, so <laughs> Ida had a, had a great time hearing all of, uh, of uh, Francis' stories about the early days with, with Ayn Rand in Hollywood, which uh, I thought was, was, was rather interesting. And Ida actually knew Ayn Rand as well at that point in time, so that created uh, more interest for her. And then the second thing goes to Friedman's uh, visit as you know, he kind of hijacked uh, the conference to a certain extent. He was famous, and when he showed up, everybody kind of went out and listened to, to uh, Milton. And Milton, as he often was, was extremely rude uh, in his uh, discussions, which we've heard what he had to say. And Ida was, was sitting next to Francis, and Francis' comment was, I suppose he doesn't think there's a Chicago school. <laughs> which... <laughs> It would, not only it was, uh, you know, quite trenchant at the time, but as you know, as you probably realize today, the Chicago school is almost gone. Uh, so today, there, there's uh, there's hardly a Chicago school in the sense that there used to be, for for better or for worse. Well, at any rate, so that's kind of my my recollection. One more thing I would want to add: everyone talks about how horrible it was. Well, you know, I'm I'm a Canadian, a. Uh, eh? And <laughs> so having grown up in Northern Ontario in my summers, uh, and of course that was back in the days when Canada was more socialistic than the United States, which, um, you know, I, I, I made the wrong immigration move <laughs> because now that's reversed, right? But so it was much poorer, as you'd expect, of a socialist country. To me, this was just like a normal Northern Ontario <laughs> resort. <laughs> I never, this is the first I've discovered it was a pest hole, you know? 
<laughs> now, I will tell you that I'm, I'm now uh, become for the rest, for much of my life, an entrepreneur. So I'm the subject of which I hadn't realized that Austrian economics had become so interested uh, in entrepreneurship. It was obviously a major part of this conference. So I'm becoming the subject uh, of the study instead of the, the studier. But I, I happen to be working on, on a deal uh, in, uh, in New Hampshire, 25 miles from South Royal. Uh, which I was there last week, I'm going back there this week, and I drove over there and I can't find a trace of the hotel, so <laughs> time has eliminated it. Well, at any rate, how did I get there? I was at UCLA, and you know, UCLA at the time was a very different school. It was the most libertarian school in the country. Uh, it was a school that you know, wasn't sold on uh, the neoclassical model. We, we, we taught it, we, we learned it, because you know, we had to hopefully survive uh, if we graduated and when we graduated, and obviously many of the graduates really haven't survived. Very few of us are uh, tenured faculty anymore. Uh, almost all of us went into business or other things. I think the training there was, was great for that, not, not necessarily for being an academic. And the, but you know, the whole idea of how you get to equilibrium, how you use information, we had the Austrians as part of our reading lists. Um, you know, uh, <coughs> Demsets and Alcian were big fans of uh, uh, everybody really except Murray. Uh, you know, Murray was kind of like Friedman. I mean, <laughs> both of them could be charming, but they could be pretty abrasive too, and they'd run into that side of, of Murray, um, which is unfortunate because he's an extraordinarily brilliant guy, and I think if he'd been a little still more accommodating to those guys, he might have uh, might have had great common cause with them. So, uh, you know, we went, David Henderson and myself, another Canadian, um, we went down uh, to uh, UCLA together. We went to South Royalton together, which, by the way, another reason South Royalton didn't seem so bad is at the time Roy Childs was living with us in LA. And I don't know who remembers Roy Childs. So <laughs> having Roy Childs in your home is uh, you know, the definition of entropy. So, <laughs> so <laughs> you know, anywhere else we went was an upgrade, as, as Ida will, <laughs> will attest. <laughs> of course, Roy was incredibly brilliant and inc incredibly charming. At any rate, so we went to <laughs> South Royalton, you know, as, as fans of Austrian economics, but people also who were very uh, fascinated with the new institutionalism at UCLA. And, you know, UCLA, already you could see the the uh, death throes of monetarism to a large degree. There was only one monetarist there. There were a bunch of other people with various odd views, really, that, that haven't survived. But you know, a good understanding that lots of parts of monetarism wasn't going to cut it. And so you know, we had a whole different view from people coming from a more conventional background and felt you know, really at home in South Royalton and, and a lot of things that we were, we were interested in. Now, for me, I was kind of dismayed at the whole of hostility between the monetarists and the, and the Austrians. And here's where I'll probably get myself in trouble, but what the heck. You know, I'm not an academic anymore, so you can discount whatever I say, right? Uh, well, to me, if I looked at the, Austri the Austrian theory of the business cycle that depends on the government emulating interest rates and then wrong investment decisions of various sorts, which is an oversimplification, but I think directionally correct. And, and you look at uh, the uh, business cycle theory of Friedman, that uh, you, you have uh, the government inflating or deflating, and people get the wrong signals about price. First of all, I never could understand why they were mutually exclusive. They're both about expectations, right? So it seemed to me that you know they should be getting along with each other, but they weren't. At any rate, so I left UCLA, went to University of Chicago, thinking about expectations. At Chicago, I got heavily involved in finance. And to cut to the chase, the thing that, uh, that probably had the biggest implications for my thinking was uh, Maurice Kendall's uh, discovery uh, in circa 1950 that <coughs> the security markets were a random walk. To me, I think that's the most important empirical fact in economics. And of course, ultimately, it became evident through uh, Mert Miller and many others that that implied efficient capital markets, which you know we don't need to go into the detail on that. And ultimately, that led to Lucas. So when I got to Chicago in 76, 
Lucas had published his first and most important article on rational expectations, and really, the monetarists were already dead at Chicago. <laughs> they were gone, and rational expectations had really uh, replaced them. And you know, the monetarists survived in uh, schools like UCLA, where, where Michael Darby was, for a number of years, but had no really further influence. Okay? So you know, if I go to the uh, two key things of uh, rational expectations that, that I think are important, for us to think about and, and incorporate into Austrian economics. The first one was that to the extent things are anticipated in terms of government, whether it's interest rate manipulations or specifically the money supply, it doesn't have an effect on the economy. It's only the surprises that affect the economy. And the second thing is that econometric studies uh, can't forecast the economy. Uh, both those things, and particularly the second thing, uh, is, should be bread and butter to Austrian economics. I mean, we're all saying that uh, the government can't run the economy. And here is, you know, now there's what, a number of Nobel Prizes, Lucas, Sargent. These people are the libertarians, Lucas is. Sargent's pretty much one. Uh, <clears throat> and they basically have. Uh, refuted the government's power to really manage proactively the economy in any way. If you have a rule, the rule won't work because if the rule is understood, guys like me, entrepreneurs, are out there going, you want to you want to do this to me? I'm not accepting it. You know, you manipulate the interest rate, I'm not going to borrow, which I can tell you actually I've done. Uh, so to me, uh, you know, the, the core Austrian idea of how you get to equilibrium and how markets react is really manifest in rational expectations, and I'd like to see uh, a lot more connections between the two. And I'll close with saying that <clears throat> you always have to promote yourself, of course. First of all, a, a lot more detail than what I've had to say, uh, it, Ida and I wrote, <clears throat> excuse me, in the uh, July 97 Liberty Magazine. So you can take a look and sort of ties all together. I think it's one of the few places where you'll see the uh, rational expectations as a logical outcome of efficient markets, uh, the, the finance and the macroeconomics. And then the other thing, if you think that math is required, you know, the two books by Merton Miller, uh, Miller on Derivatives and, finan and then Miller on Financial Innovations, we, we edited, <coughs> I edited both those books. I helped with it to some extent. They're published in the 90s, uh, 91 when he won the first prize, the Nobel Prize, and, uh, and 95. Those are great books, they're accessible, they're not mathematical. Uh, it seems to me they'd be highly congenial to Austrians seeking to understand these things. <clears throat>